thanks for joining this uh, latest faculty tech talk. Um, so we're going to be talking today um, a bit about kind of a, a downstream aspect of doing machine learning, and that's visibility and monitoring in machine learning systems uh, once they've been deployed. Um, so start off with uh, a couple of introductions. Um, so I'm Scott, uh, I'm a lead data scientist at faculty. I've been here um, about five years over a couple of teams and I work with our clients across both the public and private sectors to customize and deploy our machine learning software uh, for them. Um, I'm gonna talk for the kind of first half of the, um, the talk today and then gonna hand over to uh, Victor who's joining me. So Victor, um, uh, you know, we work in the same team, Victor focuses kind of on the, the infrastructure and deployment side of the machine learning systems and he's gonna take, through as a, take us through a, a case study later on. Uh, so I'll let him do some further intro when we get to, to his piece. Um, so in case you're not familiar with faculty, so we our mission basically is to, to make AI real. Um, so what that means is we recognize that AI is like fundamentally a very important uh, technology at the moment, but um, it's not really that useful if people aren't using it. So making AI real to us means, um, you know, making it valuable by applying it into the real world. So integrating it into systems, um, improving performance, you know, and, and that means that commercial organizations can improve ROI, public services can provide um, you know, better service to, uh, to, to the public. Um, and that's why kind of the deployment of machine learning is something we're very interested in. Um, so we were founded in 2014, have been growing since then. So overall, we've completed um, over 200 data science projects uh, across various areas of public and private sectors, so over 20 sectors in total. And that uh, spans over uh, 13 countries. Um, and as a sample of some of the organizations we've, we've worked with on the slide. So to move on to um, like what the plan for today is. Um, so as I mentioned, I'm going to talk kind of a bit of an introduction about machine learning systems and monitoring and visibility firstly. And we're going to start with some discussion of traditional software systems first. So um, you know, machine learning software systems are first and foremost software systems. Uh, so you know, we shouldn't neglect uh, everything that's been learned from deploying and monitoring you know, more traditional systems. Uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about what additional requirements there are uh, and techniques we've developed for machine learning systems specifically. And then, as I mentioned, Victor is going to take us through a case study of applying these kind of uh, techniques uh, based on uh, actual work faculty has done. So we're going to talk about a, a case study that involves uh, machine learning employed for um, running a marketing campaign for a large retailer. Uh, and then we'll wrap up with kind of some learnings and conclusions after that. So as I said, um, you know, machine learning system, software systems are first and foremost software systems. So uh, it's kind of a, you know, everything that applies to traditional systems, as we'll call them, uh, still applies to machine learning systems. So we need to, to do that first and, and do that well. So they're kind of essentially two, two main reasons, I think, why I'd say we, we monitor deployed systems. Uh, and I, I'd break that down into a uh, reactive component and, and a more proactive component. So the, the reactive component is most visible you know, in big events such as outages. So this is when something's already gone very wrong and you know, it's impacting your, your, the software's ability to, to do anything for the customer. So for example, yeah, the website may be down. Um, you know, if you're a retailer, customers might not be able to add items to the cart. They might not be able to check out. Um, they're probably starting to shout at you on Twitter. Um, so outages are very damaging, you know, in, in terms of brand as well as actual customer experience. Um, they're also the most obvious to spot because when you have an outage, it's very clear that things have gone wrong now. Um, Monitoring is still very valuable in this case because you want to be able to hopefully determine you know, an outage has occurred immediately before you get to the point where customers are able to, you know, start entering support channels so you can fix it as quickly as possible. Um, so while monitoring is very important for outages, uh, it's also very important for the more proactive uh, you know, approach to problem solving. Um, so we summarize this here as trends. So this is when you know, metrics and things you're monitoring indicate that there's a potential future problem. So 
you don't have a current outage, it's not impacting customers now, but it's showing you that if you don't take some remedial action in, you know, in, in the near future, then there could be an outage further on. So, you know, a, a great canonical example of this is, you know, if you're tracking your, your disk usage on your production servers and that's growing at a certain linear rate, then you can project when you're going to run out of disk space. That means you can do something about it before your application runs out of disk space and you know can no longer uh, service customers. So we're going to think about monitoring and the things where why we're monitoring in terms of these two concepts: so detecting outages and then looking for trends that are going to indicate to us where we should be taking remedial action. Um, and the kind of events that can go wrong, the kind of things we're monitoring for are extremely varied. Um, so even the, the kind of traditional software systems, as, as we'll call them, like maybe non-machine learning systems have been around for a very long time. And uh, you know, a, a much better known quantity than deployed machine learning systems. Uh, there's still a tremendous amount of things that can go wrong. And you know, it, even the very largest tech companies with the teams that are most experienced and most established about deploying and maintaining very large software systems from time to time still have, you know, very catastrophic outages. And, you know, that just demonstrates that um, even when we're looking at machine learning systems, we shouldn't neglect all the stuff that can go wrong just because this is software first and foremost. Um, so there's a bunch of examples here. And, you know, these can be as low down as the actual hardware, you know, disks fail, you know, data center that your application is hosted in might suffer a power outage. Um, all the way kind of up through your stack. You know, you, you didn't provision enough resource for an application because you, you didn't expect the kind of usage you, you did once it was deployed, all the way up to, you know, just application errors, like logic or programming errors that weren't sufficiently tested in development and made it through to production. So for the entire stack from, from the hardware to your like custom business logic, there's, there's quite a lot that can go wrong. Um, and outside of the software, there's also, you know, the human factor. Um, even the you know, best practices uh, today are to, to use things like infrastructure as code for deployment to have all your like deployment and infrastructure expressed declaratively and versioned. There's always still an engineer or data scientist involved and sometimes mistakes happen. Um, you, know, you may run a destructive command to tear down some infrastructure that you think you are running against a personal dev cluster that you're working on, but you might run it in a different environment. Um, so there's quite a lot that can go wrong all the all the way through the stack. And um, we found it useful. So as we kind of bisected the kind of problems you can you, you try to monitor for into outages and trends, we also find it useful to categorize the that large domain into two pieces when we're thinking about what we need to monitor and how we build monitoring systems. Uh, and we split this into infrastructure and applications. So this is a, a nice boundary kind of between what's my custom business logic that is, that is like solving the actual problem and what's all the compute and storage uh, and networking underneath that. That's more generic, but uh, e equally important. And there's some examples here of, of, of how you might, you know, the kind of outages or trends that might occur both in infrastructure and applications. So, for example, you know, a large outage in infrastructure is something like uh, server hardware breaking. Um, you know, you want to be able to detect that immediately, hopefully automatically roll over. But even if you roll over, you'll need to notify someone, you know, via your monitoring that you know, that broken server needs replacing or, or a remedial action needs taken. Um, right down to the bottom right, if we look at kind of trends in applications, these are much more likely to be metrics that you're looking at over time. So. Uh, if I have a very large application with many users, I'm going to expect from time to time certain errors, certain exceptions are going to pop up, say users are sending badly formatted data or something. But if that fraction is growing consistently over time, then that's indicative that maybe actually the, the customer behavior is changing in a way that we've not accounted for, or we've deployed some code changes that we haven't you know, fully understood the impact it's going to have on the customer base, and we should do something about that. Um, so this like simple grid we find useful to decide you know what to monitor and, and how to monitor it, and also helps you know a cross-functional team of like SREs, software engineers, and data scientists understand what responsibility belongs to who. Um, 
so that was all kind of in the context of of traditional software systems and still needs to be done but um you know the systems we build at faculty uh, overwhelmingly uh, have machine learning or ai at their core uh, and we found that you know, although all the traditional software monitoring still applies uh, machine learning systems come with some of their own challenges uh, involved in that and that's what we're going to focus um, you know, a lot of the remainder of the talk on today so like I said, the, the infrastructure application monitoring um, still applies. You know, your, uh, your software is still running on some infrastructure. That infrastructure might even be more complex than in a more traditional software system if you're needing things like hardware accelerators like GPUs or TPUs, uh, inference time, if uh, your system is dependent on like very large training sets that needed to be available for retraining, so you need like large storage arrays. Um, but in addition to, to the infrastructure and applications, there's kind of two further domains that, that enter into play when you consider machine learning systems. Um, and that's the data and, and the model itself. Um, we kind of think about this as the data being everything that is coming into the system prior to a prediction being made, and then model encompassing that process of prediction. And then you, know, you can imagine the predictions that come out of the model are also numeric data. Uh, that falls into what we consider model monitoring. Um, and a big, a big difference that we identify between the system, the kind of monitoring that applies to traditional systems and the monitoring that applies to data and models and machine learning systems is that data and model monitoring is uh, much more closely linked to the specific task you're solving. So I gave the example earlier of monitoring, uh, you know, your infrastructure to see if you're running out of disk space. But that's basically invariant to the task, right? In, independently of what your business logic is, what your application is doing, uh, you don't want to run out of disk space. But what invariance the data that's entering a model um, you know, should satisfy is, is actually very dependent on the task. So it requires a lot more customization for specific use cases. It has a lot more dependency on knowing what you're doing and, and like what the uh, eventual use case is. So it's, it's much less generic, the kind of data and modeling components. And we found, therefore, is something that often requires a bit more building than integrating like existing, you know, uh, existing monitoring services or, or SaaS products. So one kind of uh, additional thing about data and model monitoring kind of being more bespoke and, and more uh, customized to a particular use case is also that data models tend to break more insidiously than infrastructure and applications. It's actually, in our experience, not very common to have something that you'd categorize as like a model outage or a data outage. And if it is, it's often simplistic things like networking between data storage and the compute nodes went down. Um, you're much more likely to, you know, identify in model or data monitoring like degradations than you are outages. So, you know, the accuracy of your predictions when you back, back test them starts going down in a way you don't immediately understand. Or the data that's going into your model is starting to drift from the data it was trained on slowly over time, which is reducing the quality of your predictions. Like neither of these are things you can just assert by, you know, checking an invariant. You can't just assert that the the, the mean or variance of the data that is entering your model is a certain value, or that you know when you back test your model has a particular accuracy. Um, so there's a, a few more examples here. So you know, in any real world data set, you're going to experience missing values. Certain data want to be collected. Customers want to fill certain uh, pieces in. Um, so often it's expected that you're going to have some missing data at some percentage. But also, you know, it's a failure scenario that you need to monitor for when your data is becoming increasingly, like increasingly uh, containing missing values. It, we can't just say a column shouldn't include missing values, like it's going to fail as soon as you deploy it. But we do need to monitor and understand if that's increasing, like where's our threshold? What implications does it have for the system performance? Um, Similarly, in the, in the model domain, this is perhaps even harder, especially when you have complex models. Um, you want to identify things such as class imbalance, like is over time the, the, the balance of classes that your model is predicting uh, differing from that in training. So some of the assumptions and metric choices you made during training no longer apply. 
This can be especially insidious in things like recommendation systems where you have a feedback loop between the predictions of a model and letter data. So you know, if I'm building a recommender system, you know, a great example being Netflix recommending what movie you should watch next. Um, if that model is successful, then most customers' preferences are going to be informed by movies they've watched that were originally recommended to them by that same model. Um, so this is much more dependent on the task and much harder to specify as a set of invariants than, um, than infrastructure or, or application modeling. Uh, and this is where we find uh, a lot of the difficulty arises. Um, so some of the kind of lessons we've learned from, from data monitoring and, and things we, we try to apply now are, are covered here. Um, so I think what's really important is to make sure you have a bunch of strong prerequisites in place. So even though monitoring feels like it's like one of the later aspects of the deployment process of a machine learning project, really it'll, it'll, it'll be very beneficial to be thinking about these requirements uh, much earlier on in the, in the process. Um, you'll want even at the training stage and initial development stage to be adopting you know, good practices from software development uh, to your data pipeline. So you know, ideally make sure they're reproducible, make sure they're versioned, you know, code review pipelines as you would code review um, application code. When you are monitoring something in production or you're experiencing some trends that you, 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 know, you, you don't understand where they're coming from, it's really important to be able to very quickly look up, well, what pipeline has generated this? What set of transformations is it? What data was this model trained on? Um, it also gives you the ability to roll back when monitoring indicates that, that something's going wrong. Um, being able to do these kind of rollbacks and, and making things reproducible also um, is basically only enabled if, if, you if you have immutable data. So this might mean taking actual immutable snapshots of like um, static data sets, or it might mean, you know, if, you if you're working with time series data, like taking time timestamp snapshots so you can play back data that was streamed in over a, a particular time period. Um, and with those two, you're going to be able to, you know, roll back bad model deploys. You're going to be able to compare historical models to current models. And this is the stuff that's going to make your monitoring useful. If you have a monitoring dashboard that you know, tells you that the number of nulls you're experiencing in data is going up, but you can't quickly tell what version of the data pipelines is deployed and what you should roll back to when you identify that, then that's not going to be very useful. Um, and then similar kind of rules apply to, to, to your raw data and, and also on the degenerated features. Um, so you have a versioned data pipeline, hopefully. You also want to ensure that the kind of distributions that are coming out of that pipeline represent those um, it was designed for and it was trained on. Um, and, and as I mentioned kind of on the previous slide, really important to identify when you have any feedback loops. So yeah, uh, recommendation systems are a good example, but not the only one. Uh, this can be really insidious. It can give you like positive feedback loops. So no one understand uh, if that's happening. And on the model monitoring front, um, so a kind of first, uh, first and important best practice, um, it's kind of at the stage where you're going to deployment, um, just perform historical back tests after you're retraining the model. Um, it, I think it's often, you know, it's often assumed that model retraining is a good thing. You, you want to periodically retrain your model so you maintain performance, even if you experience distributional shift from the data you're observing. Um, and while that's true, it's also useful to make sure that new retrained models are not regressing in other ways uh, that you've not identified. Um, you know, so playback, you know, when you have a new model ready for deployment, you know, compare it against the previously deployed, mod, previously deployed version of the model, identify if its performance has improved on recent data. Uh, also play it back against previous iterations of the model and understand why behavior differs and understand whether that's due to the, the retraining procedure or if it's other um, you know, pipeline or process changes that uh, have not yet been identified. And then you know, if, if you're comfortable with that and you feel you've understood differences in performance in the model, then you know, push it into production and, and monitor metrics about predictions. Um, I think this doesn't need to be super fancy in the first case. Like you, you'll get a lot of value just from 
simple things like plotting over time, like the the like mean the variance, like simple descriptive statistics of predictions and data enter in the model. Even though these are quite simplistic like measures, they can often be good uh, early indicators of, of problems before they crop up. And they're also quite interpretable. So if you have a domain expert or a data scientist um, looking at uh, you know, monitoring dashboards, uh, it, it's quite easy to see how this relates back to the data coming in uh, compared to uh, you know, maybe fancier metrics. Um, so that's kind of the, the, the uh, general kind of learnings and approaches, how we break down monitoring into the components we think apply to um, machine learning systems specifically, but also you know, including all the stuff that still applies to the, the software component of the system. Uh, so to hopefully make this uh, more concrete now, Victor's going to take us through um, like an exact uh, a case study based on, based on you know a kind of combination of of real work we've done in the past, uh, hopefully to illuminate some of these points. So I'll hand over to him. Thanks, Scott. Let me. Okay. So well, welcome all to the to this tech talk. Uh, happy to be here. We after Scott has been sort of has given a. a, a wide overview on what we need to monitor, which things are useful to monitor in, this, in these systems. I'm trying to make things a bit more specific towards how can you build an architecture or a software system that actually allows you to monitor these things in a way that you don't need to build from scratch a huge amount of uh, tooling and machinery every single new project. The example I'm going to sort of the case study I'm going to discuss on is a retail marketing campaign that uh, is based on uh, sort of a project that we have done in the past. But we're going to assume this is we're working with the Acme Corporation, which has a great amount of products that uh, wants to sort of uh, publicize in a weekly ma catalog mailing campaign. And they have great products that they want to, to promote, like the latest product is this rocket powered unicycle, which doesn't sound dangerous at all. And obviously they want to uh, share it with the existing customers uh, because they are interested in this, in this kind of products, but they want to also reactivate old customers. They want to have uh, customers that are interested in their products and so on. So we're going to use machine learning to improve the return on investment of this campaign. And uh, an important thing that we want to do is not use uh, propensity models, which tend to be tend to be models that predict how likely is a given customer to buy. But we actually want to predict uh, what is the best use of our marketing budget in the in the marketing campaign. So to that end, we, what we want to figure out is what is the up, the best uplift that our treatment is going to have on our customers. In this case, we have three choices of treatment. One is no treatment at all, so not sending a catalog to a customer, sending a short catalog probably for customers that are already quite familiar with uh, with our offering, or that just don't like reading that much. And the long catalog for people who are more uh, sort of who might be uh, more interested in, in all the features and, and all the sort of different products that, that, the, that the company has. And important thing here with Uplift is that we don't want to send catalogs to either the customers that are very likely to buy or to those that uh, went send more marketing information will just get annoyed at the company and not and, and look elsewhere or think that the company is, is sort of widening too much their product and therefore uh, are not sure of their quality like maybe we have a customer that really likes the explosive tennis balls of Acme Corp but things that going into rocket powered unicycles is broadening too much and they're losing their focus so we don't really want to market rocket powered unicycles at them so which raw data sources do we have in this example Obviously, the, there is a lot of information that the company has on their customers. The first one is the order history. So and we can derive features, such time-based features, like how long has it been since their last or second to last or third to last order? What is the lifetime value of each customer to date? Uh, how many orders have they placed in the last year or in the lifetime or in the last two years, et cetera? And then we also know when we have contacted them before, like how long has it been since they received the last catalog? How long has it been since they received our last marketing email? Did they interact with that marketing email? And also user activity in web, app, email, and phone conversations with sort of customer service. And we can also derive quite a few features in there. 
and obviously other demographic or behavior data that comes from our sort of information or from external data sources, data brokers and so on. A critical thing about these raw data sources, as uh, Scott already mentioned, is that we want them, we want to ingest them in a way that allows us to time travel, that allows us to be to have reproducible ways of generating these features and also be able to retrieve them at any given point in time for any for any customer. And that will allow us to build a sort of an API to interact with the features and with the feature values on, on which we can build uh, tooling that allows us to monitor and observe all our data pipelines and models deployed in production. So a very useful tool for, um, for doing this is a feature store. Feature stores are machine learning specific data systems that have been gaining popularity over the last couple of years. And effectively what they are is a, a sort of a tool or a, or a system that contains several very useful uh, sort of functionalities around managing features for machine learning. The first one is it, it runs pipelines that transform raw data into the feature values. Then there's a system to store them in a sort of efficient and performant way. And finally, a system to serve them either for model serving, in which case it's like a low latency, there's, there would be a low latency store for uh, the feature values at the current uh, time, but you also want it to be able to retrieve training data sets at multiple times, whether that is for points in the past for a set of customers or for like customer, like tuples of customer ID and timestamp uh, for many of these tuples so that you can build a training data set for which you have collected labels, which are, which could be the outcomes of whether those customers at some point after that timestamp within like a certain attribution period, they have uh, bought products from, from, uh, from the store. And an important thing in, in this is that because we have this system in a single place, we can also build tooling so that uh, <clears throat> practitioners as in machine learning engineers and data scientists can define the features in a certain standardized way. They can define the feature as an expression, which could be a SQL expression or a Python expression in our case. And uh, the feature store manages, so they could attach some metadata to that feature definition, as in what type of aggregate, is it an aggregate metric? What type of aggregate metric? Is it a, a sort of a window-based metric or how often do we need to recompute it? And also how, uh, what it's TTL, so what it's time to live, how long after we have computed a feature, will that feature be relevant for, uh, for machine learning? And all of these are very task specific things and feature specific things. So it's not something that we can decide uh, centrally in a way, no? but they can be done uh, from the point of view of the practitioner. And then the feature store manages the whole system to uh, the data pipelines that will use these feature, feature definitions to populate the feature store and then be able to serve them. Uh, a useful thing, uh, I mean, it's not immediately obvious how this helps with monitoring, but the reason that uh, sort of we bring this up is that this establishes, uh, the most important thing in my opinion is that this establishes an API to interact with features uh, throughout time uh, in the system. And what this means is that we have very clear entry points at which we can uh, make sort of check, uh, monitor the data and the models and have checks on them. So for example, in the transformation pipelines, we would have, we can do sanity checks on the raw data with tooling like great expectations, which is a great uh, data validation framework. Then we can compute aggregate features that can be stored for monitoring purposes so that we can see uh, sort of things that are not generally our transform features, but are features that are sort of metrics of the raw data. And we can also add streaming checks like page Hingley text tests or CU sums that effectively allow you to see whether the whether some metric on the on the that is coming in as part of the raw data is drifting. Then we can also do these checks on the generated feature values. And the nice thing here is that we have already a lot of information about these feature values from the feature definitions that the practitioners have provided. So that we can also do these sort of sanity checks, but they can be a bit more uh, strict since we know what type they can have. We know which they have we have it has been defined whether they can be which can be null or or whether they have strict limits and so on and so forth and we can also measure distribution shift between time windows and 
This now becomes very easy because we have a good uh, sort of all the machinery to retrieve feature values for given time windows is contained in the feature store. So it's very easy to build pipelines that will sort of compute these distribution shift metrics between uh, time windows. And now we'll see which things uh, we found interesting in, in this particular use case. And then finally, you can also check the model properties. So the, so the things that Scott was mentioning before, basically you can either uh, look at metrics at model training, or you can check the predictions, sort of metrics on the predictions that the models have been uh, sort of returning or storing as part of the production pipelines. So how do you monitor data as part of the sort of, how do you monitor the feature values? An interesting thing is that you, you want to sample these feature value distributions from different groups of entities and different timestamps to answer different questions. The first question would be whether the model, the current model has been trained on valid data for that compared to the distributions that are currently in production. And for this, you would compare the sort of the, um, the, the feature values for the training entities. So for the customer ID and timestamps that were used at training time with the feature values at the current time. And then you can see whether the sort of the new uh, predictions are compatible with the, with, the valid data, with the training data. You can also check between different time windows. So you could, if you compare the, all the values at current time with most values at uh, past times, then you can assess data drift. You can assess whether these uh, feature values are drifting over time. And then you can do, you can, since you have all this system that contains the feature values, you can also use the feature store to answer things that might not be immediately useful to the machine learning or might not to the machine learning model or might not be, might not immediately affect, but are important uh, business things like are, is, are some of these features changing in ways because of external, uh, of, of external sort of uh, reasons, things like obviously the sort of COVID, pan COVID pandemic has been one of the big things that has changed the behavior of effectively every single machine learning system in the world. But in, in this case, you could also extract useful business information from this feature store. So which actual checks have we tested and found useful? Uh, when comparing between distributions, there's a lot of metrics of distances between distributions that have been in use for decades. Things like the kalbach leibler divergence, kolmogorov smirnov distance, or population stability index. They try to effectively find distances between uh, distributions and have sort of drawbacks and advantages between them. So it's not always uh, immediate to say like, well, you should use scale divergence for basically every single distribution uh, distribution comparison. We've also found useful this entropy of rank comparison distribution, which I'll talk a bit more in, in, a, in a bit, which is a good way of comparing to like uh, two histograms effectively. And then um, you might also want to compare single or small amounts or, or a small number of observations with a learned distribution. So you might want to check whether this particular uh, sort of observation that has come in and I want to make a prediction on top of uh, is compatible with the distribution that we originally saw in um, in training or that we have been seeing over the past two weeks, for example. So for this, autoencoders are very useful. You could use sort of what is the reconstruction loss using an autoencoder has been trained on the training data, or you could use latent space metrics uh, using a variational autoencoder that will tend to have compact representations in the in latent space. And what this allows you to do is, uh, is to sort of assess whether, for example, a given observation is in an area of latent space where we know that our model has high test uh, accuracy or uh, whether it is in a low, in an area of low density so that we might sort of think that it is sort of out of domain and, and act on these things. And, and the nice thing about these metrics is that they can be assessed on a, on a single request uh, on, a, on a sort of for each, for each new request. Obviously the drawback is that training an autoencoder uh, or a variation autoencoder is not trivial, uh, especially so more so for very complex data. So there is a, there's a, a significant overhead and you might need to update it as you update the training data and so on. Then for, for sort of streaming systems and, and time series, you have other ways of detecting the, the drift. There's CU sum, which in which you can sort you can 
detect drifts for for the for the mean values of a distribution and there's also online bayesian change point detection which was uh, sort of proposed by uh, adams and McCain in a, in a not in a quite recent paper in which both of these are ways to assess whether a given time series has changed is being sampled from a different distribution than, than in a different uh, in a in a previous point in time so for batch systems in which you want to compare between two distributions which would be the first the first category we've used the entropy of frank comparison distribution which is a relatively simple metric in which you have two uh, distributions in this case x1 and x2 x1 would be the blue one and x2 is the purple one and what you do is you uh, build a histogram of the values of x2 in the percentiles of uh, distribution x1 and what you get for two distributions that are quite similar are is what we have on the top row in which it is close to uniform but when the distributions are quite different you get something like the bottom row in which you see that if in, in this case the variances are quite different so uh, you will see that the the histogram of x2 on top of the sort of percentiles of x1 has peaks at the sort of bottom and top ends and then from this you can compute a single number that where it shows what, like what is the entropy of this distribution if the entropy is very high you are close to uniform so there it's close to you can think that both distributions are similar if the entropy is is, is much lower uh, it is an indication that they are different and this is like a good and and this is a, a metric that is quite robust to sort that you can apply to feature values that have very different distributions and very different uh, sort of ranges and and so on so it is useful in the sense that it is quite robust and it's not really only applicable to uh, to analytical distributions or to very uh, close to normal distributions so how do you model how do you what can you check on on the models uh, as i already mentioned you can do sort of comparisons of the distributions of the predictions in this case, uh, what is the predicted uplift for each of the treatments? You could compare that over time. And you can also check what is the entropy of a multi-class classifier. So the, the less sure a classifier is of, the, of its predictions, it's likely that the data that it's being asked to make predictions on top of is uh, drifting further away from the, from the data it was trained on. And uh, finally, we can also look at at sort of the live, sort of the, the live data that the, as it's going in, whether it matches onto the onto the sort of data it has been trained on. This will also be a, I already mentioned it above, but this is also closely tied to the to the model because we want to look at model training uh, data sets or feature sets. And finally, you also want to have back testing, where this is not something that you can do on the live model, mostly because very often on these systems, you won't have the outcomes of the prediction. So in, in our case, whether the customers actually end up buying after they have, they have received a catalog or not, um, you will not have at prediction time. So you cannot really do live uh, monitoring of those aspects, but you can do it after the fact. Uh, a useful thing here is that for many of these back tests or for model training for this sort of systems, uh, whenever you want to yeah, train an, an uplift model it's definitely useful to have random data so data that uh, customers that have been treated in a random manner so that you can really assess what is the uplift of a certain treatment and in this case you would back test against these random data and see whether like test your predict the predictions for your model against past data and see whether it would uh, match the sort of uh, the properties of what actually happened and sort of at this at this stage of when you're back testing, you can look also at more like high level business metrics. What is the return investment on a given campaign? What is the actual uplift that your campaign is, is, is resulting in? And so on. So finally, as a general architecture, these feature stores allows us to have an API to sort of an, an, a standardized API to all the sort of data aspects of our system. And that is quite valuable because then we can build this operational observability module effectively on top of the feature store and on top of our storage uh, so that it ingests uh, so that it runs pipelines to uh, to compute the metrics that that we are interested in 
but also ingests, also looks at the metrics that have been returned from model serving and model training pipelines. And in this case, what we found is that, uh, yeah, uh, what we found is that the first, as, as Scott already mentioned, we found that the first port of call should usually be something like an interactive dashboard. And that's because it's not easy, even though we have all these metrics, it's very hard for to establish thresholds for metrics that are that apply to all the tasks that we want to use. And because of that, we sort of need some uh, human factors in the loop. We need a human in the loop that initially understands all of these metrics and is able to have to do an interactive exploration with the of, of these metrics. And, and this person needs to be a domain expert, both from the sort of business point of view of the actual outcomes of our machine learning system, but also an expert on the machine learning system itself so that they can really know which are the relevant metrics for the machine learning system. Uh, what we've built in the past around this is uh, dashboards with Superset or Grafana, which are very powerful at building uh, dashboards quickly and sort of on top of, uh, on top of databases. And it's at this stage, we have, we need a, a, a data scientist or machine learning engineer or a business associate that effectively over time uh, learns which ranges of these metrics that we have mentioned before are acceptable for our particular task. And there, there's an iterative process here in which we go back to the dashboard and improve the metrics or think about different metrics or think about different comparisons between time windows, et cetera. And once one of these, some of these metrics are very well understood and we say like, well, we have clearly seen that whenever the, the, the sort of the KLA versions between this week's, uh, this week's distribution for certain metrics and last week's is above a certain value, we, that's clearly a threshold where our machine learning system uh, degrades. Then this can be moved to sort of uh, production monitoring uh, with alerts systems that should already be in place for the sort of traditional software systems monitoring aspects. And for this, we use Prometheus at the sort of within, within the system and, and then PagerDuty or Ops Genie to sort of manage alerts and rotors and et cetera, et cetera. In addition to that, uh, you also need to think about these things from the very start. So if you only think about monitoring and, about monitoring and, uh, and alerting, at the time of deployment, you're going to struggle quite a lot because by that time, uh, there will be a lot of expertise on the data, expertise on the machine learning model that, uh, that might have been lost from early stages of development or that will not go into the sort of, uh, into the production system. So it's very important to assess these sort of data constraints and caveats of the machine learning component from the start, from the first stages of development and it's very hard to, so it's, if you don't have a good process, it's very easy for this information to be lost in the path to production. And what this looks like is that these components could be, end up being integrated into very robust monitored uh, software systems, but without regards for their sort of stochasticity and failure modes that machine learning systems, because as we already mentioned, these are different from, uh, from many applications and infrastructure uh, aspects of traditional software systems. So if, if you find yourself in these situations, it's very, a paper that uh, was published recently and, I, and we found very useful as a framework to think about these things, is uh, technology readiness levels for machine learning systems which is a framework for developing sort of robust, reliable, responsible machine learning systems and introduces a few sort of uh, artifacts and processes around things like a TRL card, a technology readiness level card, which is not too dissimilar from the model card that Google, Google is, is uh, sort of has, has talked about and made public. And then it also establishes a, a, a path to getting to production. And the nice thing about this is that each stage of the deployment is focused on certain things and there is established paths to, of communication between these earlier stages and the later production stages. Um, so yeah, definitely take a look at that if you, are, if you find yourself uh, get, being surprised by things in production that would have been sort of, should have been better communicated uh, up to there. And finally, in our conclusion, conclusions, uh, Scott, do you want to take over? 
Yeah, thanks. Um, yes, I should just mention actually before we go into the conclusions. So if uh, if you have any questions, uh, there's a little Q and A button in the black bar at the bottom of Zoom. So if you um, type in questions there, we've got a few minutes. Um, and Victor and I will try and go through and answer those uh, uh, towards the end. Um, yeah. So um, kind of tried to. I think there's there's a lot we've learned in kind of building monitoring for deployed systems, but we've tried to like pull out and distill um, like the the three main takeaways and, and kind of the the not mechanical pieces, but kind of the insight pieces we found from them. Um, I think here, firstly, is is the thing we've we've spoken about uh, initially. Yeah, AI and machine learning is very exciting, uh, but if you look kind of at a deployed machine learning system in the aggregate. Um, most of it is just software in the non-machine learning sense. So ML systems are first and foremost software systems. So make sure you're covering all the fundamentals that you would for other applications in terms of like infrastructure and application monitoring. Um, the secondly, on top of that, you know, there are the additional dependencies, uh, additional monitoring requirements for the data and the model. I think our, our main learning uh, in this regard is um, you need to think about these differently to infrastructure and application modeling, uh, monitoring because they're, you know, as we've discussed, as Victor's given some examples of, um, they're much harder to monitor by just like a certain invariance or thresholds. And you will need to do things like look at distributions, spend some time with uh, a system deployed, look in how these distributions evolve over the time and understand where and how you want to, to set thresholds. Um, and this kind of falls into the, the third main takeaway. So although we're talking about machine learning, we're talking about deployed systems, it almost like has, has automation as a core part of what we're trying to achieve. Um, it's extremely valuable um, to maintain a human in the loop uh, in, in, in building a monitoring. Um, like without a human in the loop, um, you, at the best case, you're going to miss opportunities to, to feed into monitoring things that you could. So as Victor said, like having someone, a domain expert, a, a business associate, looking at the dashboards regularly when a system is first deployed and understanding like the normal operating parameters, um, they're going to be able to like, like from understanding that pull out some, some new metrics that we should be monitoring that we're not, they're going to be able to understand the failure scenarios that you can build in more traditional alerting into. Um, and this loops nicely into one of the, the questions that came in was about how you, you know, deal with it's like black swan events such as COVID, like you're not going to be able to automate monitoring that takes like appropriate remedial actions for something like COVID or some other like completely um, unforeseen event. Like at, at that stage, you, you know, having a human in the loop who can like understand what's going on with greater context that's not available to the system and take remedial actions, you know, which might include like switching the system off. It might include, you know, falling back to a rules-based model. If you have some, you know, if you're say, say a transport provider and you have some huge demand shift uh, when everyone is told to work from home, then clearly like any assumptions that went into the training, the model are, you know, immediately in invalidated and it takes bigger remedial action than, anything you could uh, build into a monitoring system. Um, so they're the key takeaways. Uh, so we've got about nine minutes left. So what we'll try and do is um, go through uh, some of the, the questions now, which I have up. I think there's one I might pitch to Victor first, which asks um, kind of, do we have recommendations about like particular technologies or systems for implementing a feature store? So, Obviously, feature stores are a relatively new thing. Uh, what we've found useful is, right now, and, and we're sort of working on, we've been building on that, is uh, to use Daxter for data pipelines. It has very good sort of ergonomics around uh, around pipelines and reusability. Um, we used to use Airflow for some aspects, but we definitely think that, that Daxter gives us more flexibility. And we've built all of the transformation pipelines based on that. And then in terms of the actual feature store machinery, we used to effectively build it internally and build the whole thing internally with uh, so on. But uh, more recently, we've been looking at uh, Feast, which 
transitioned from being a GCP only feature store using GCP uh, technologies to using uh, to being more agnostic about it so that you can actually build connectors to use different uh, backend storage systems, which is useful. Um, and then there's another sort of related question. There's uh, whether there are any open repositories that we've come across that are good examples of best practice in monitoring. And I think that that's a, that's a very tricky question because as we've or sort of as we've gone through in the talk, the clear thing is that a, a well monitored and with good observability machine learning system is, is not a matter of a single component. It, it is a sort of the whole collection of the system and there needs to be like a, a sort of a good overall design. And that's generally something that is very hard to, to transmit or to showcase in, in the way that you would showcase, uh, I don't know, uh, a, a machine learning example of MNIST digit recognition uh, for which you definitely can have like uh, so something in a repository or a write-up that shows it. So it's, it's a bit more, uh, it's much more difficult to have easy sort of showcases of these things. Um, so there's one question here about um, kind of what what percentage of a monitoring system that you'd build out is reusable and like how much does that differ from use case to use case. Um, so as Victor touched on a bit there, I think, you know, historically it's been extremely bespoke um, from use case to use case, um, but we're now at the point where we're starting to build kind of um, well, initially kind of cookie cutter implementations that could be deployed uh, for similar use cases and now some kind of more customized systems. And um, so uh, like most often is, you know, if you have use cases that are technically similar, they will have um, a lot of similarities that make pieces reusable. So I think an example is um, a faculty, we have a forecasting product that uses um, Bayesian hierarchical modeling to, to, to produce forecasts for demand of you know, a product or, or some other thing that maybe you sell to customers or you have internal logistics requirements for. Um, and we have kind of chosen a, a core set of technologies that that system is built out of. And um, you know, under the hood, the techniques it uses, so it's you know, Bayesian hierarchical modeling with stochastical variational inference. Like there's a few things that are very similar between use cases, like the particular metrics you want to monitor. And um, so we kind of have a, in that example, a cookie cutter stack that um, uses some integration be be between like the underlying like probabilistic programming framework, which is NumPyro in our case, and Superset as a dashboard, which makes it kind of very easy to integrate the two. But like the, the exact kind of numerical metrics you're going to want to, to put in that, the exact schema is still uh, going to depend from use case to use case. So I think we found it, yeah, you could, you need to repeat the thinking and like the like exactly which metrics do I want for this use case, but uh, the kind of um, the the plugging it all together and the the, the pipes between the pieces um, is reusable, at least within the at least within the same technical domain, like using the the same technique. You know, if I had like a an image classifier, then uh, that probably has a lot of reusable components. But you know, a Bayesian hierarchical model and an image classifier probably would need fairly distinct monitoring requirements. We have uh, another question about from Andre around uh, how monitoring is important, but then there's the whole issue of actually when, uh, uh, when a problem is revealed, uh, one needs to go back and fix it. So find the root cause of, of the model, of the sort of, of the failure. And that's something that is, is definitely hard um, is definitely, it's not obvious when you, especially when you realize that there are these sort of degradations hap that happen quite downstream that are happening, for example, in the end, uh, like the, the distribution of the predictions of your model is, is drifting. Uh, it's very hard to immediately know where that comes from. However, uh, what I think is important from this whole framework in a way is that if you've been uh, diligent about gaining an understanding of all the different parts of your system and how the data looks at different stages of your of of the sort of of the pipelines and and so on uh, it will be easy to go it will be relatively easy to go back from that uh, and and effectively 
walk back through the pipelines and and see where things start going uh, start differing and if you have sort of versioned and reproducible pipelines and it's also easy to map that to other um, to map that to other changes in the code to changes in the pipeline to changes in the hyperparameters of the model etc cetera, etc cetera. so effectively the important thing is is here having observability on your system observability on on what has happened in the past and and what data has been flowing through it obviously a lot of these things you will as we've already mentioned sort of they're not things that you can sort of plug and play into a system because it requires quite a bit of, of domain expertise on the business problem and the machine learning system. And every use case is slightly different, but the idea would be to build as many common tools as possible so that we can, uh, so that we can then sort of focus on the important bits. Um, there's another question around the human in the loop aspect. Uh, it says like, which skill sets are needed for this individual to be effective in the monitoring? Is that a data scientist role or a business role? Uh, I think we, we say human in the loop, but it's probably more like humans in the loop evolving over the lifetime of the project and the maturity of the machine learning system. Obviously, at first, while we still don't have any sort of established metrics or any uh, deep knowledge and understanding of all these metrics, it would need to be a very technical person, it would be somebody who is like intimately knowledgeable with the machine learning model and the data and has probably been one of the people involved in the initial implementation of the model. So that would be a data scientist, a machine learning engineer. But as time goes on and, and sort of the, uh, the, the system has been used in operations uh, more often and it's better understood, that's when it can be sort of transitioned into a more business role. So something that uh, as, as the dashboard that we mentioned has been uh, honed into having better mappings between the very technical aspects and the business aspects, it's much easier for somebody in a more of a business role to look at the business aspects and, and have an easy mapping into the technical aspects so that they can escalate into more technical people and sort of they can better uh, realize when things are, are sort of things are going wrong in a relevant way and, and alert the relevant people. I think that's about it for time um so we'll wrap up now um if this was interesting and, you, and you'd like to talk more about what we do or even if you have uh, just any more questions about kind of the, the things we spoke about today and the talk um feel free to uh send us an email we'd be uh, very happy to hear from you um otherwise look out for uh, uh next faculty talk hopefully coming up soon and and have a good day have a good day thanks for attending